Okay, well, good morning and welcome to the study this morning. Uh, we're, we're going to continue our study, uh, our reading from Signs of the Times, August 4th, 1881, in relation to uh, the story of Abimelech, the son of Gideon. And before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have each morning to open your word together and to read from the counsels of the spirit of prophecy and to uh, discuss uh, the words of scripture. We ask for your Holy Spirit to direct and guide us in this process. And we pray, Lord, that the things that we understand, that we are that we come to understand, that we can share with others, and that these things will have an effect upon our Christian experience, <clears throat> that they will give us, give us a greater conviction, and um, that they will reveal to us our need of you. We pray for those who are searching for truth, those that are, are struggling with these things, making decisions. We pray that you can give them strength so that they can walk in the light that they do have, that we can have greater light, and that we can share this with others. We ask, Lord, that we can uh, reflect your character and that these things we study will help in that regard. Be with us now as we open your word together. In Jesus' name we pray and ask this. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again. So as you can see, we got here um, where we were reading in the spirit of prophecy. Now, Dwight, you were reading this. Do you, do you want to pick this up and continue reading or what would you like to do? Well, we're going, we're going to continue with this um, as, a, as a brief recap. If we take a look at Judges 9, 6 at this point. Yeah, all the men of Shechem gathered together in all the house of Milo or Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. You okay. Are. Now, the alternate reading to this verse, instead of saying by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem, it says by the oak of the pillar. Yeah, because that that's, that, that's what it says in Hebrew. It doesn't say plain. So, so I don't know why the King James chose plain of the pillar. Okay. Well, as the translators had, had gone through this, the margin reading used was Joshua 24 to 27. that gives the support for this being the oak of the pillar. Mm -hmm. Because in Joshua, if we recall, so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it there under an oak, which was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us. For it hath heard all the words of the Lord, which he spake unto us. It shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. So here's Abimelech. He has just gone to Ophrah. He has just slain all of his stepbrothers except for one. And he is now returned to his mother's family after destroying these messages. And he is now entering into a covenant that is not a covenant with God. He is entering into an idolatrous covenant. Mm -hmm. Now, 
we can recognize this as a literal idolatrous covenant, but what kind of a symbol does this give us? Well, I mean, we have the counterfeit cover covenant of the of the pagan pay, uh, paganism and papalism. The twenty five twenty is a counterfeit covenant. Covenant. It's a counterfeit of Christ's week. Um, then you know we also see the covenant with death in Isaiah twenty eight. I'm not sure what you mean, which symbol. Well, of the of those that were slain, were those not messages, or was that just one message? I mean of the 70? Yes. Well, it represents the message of a prophetic message, particularly the 70 weeks but also the 2520 itself, because the 70 weeks is just an extension of that. It's part of that structure. But because it's the 70 and you have the one left over, it would be uh, the 70 weeks with um, Jotham being the 70th week. So this, this has to do with a rejection of the understanding of prophecy. But does it also not have to do with the rejection of the understanding of chronology? Well, yes, because you, chronology is the backbone of, backbone of prophecy. Without chronology, you really couldn't have time prophecies as such. So, in other words, the men of Shechem and all of the house of Milo, Milo, whatever, the Senate of Shechem. Sanhedrin, more? Wouldn't be more, wouldn't you use more Sanhedrin? Well, I'm, I'm looking at this in a, a modern American manner. Okay. I mean, we get a concept of the Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. The Sanhedrin was comprised of learned men respected of, of the Jews, and was the Jewish court, right? Yeah, it was the 70. So, um, <clears throat> so if, yeah. if, we were, if we were going to make the application that that was like the Sanhedrin, in our current American vernacular, wouldn't that be more equivalent of the Supreme Court, the, Sa the Sanhedrin? Okay, so not the Senate. But, are you, but you're trying to put this as the Senate, not the Supreme Court. I'm trying to put this as the Senate at this point, yes. Yeah. Now, both the Senate and the Supreme Court deliberate on their pronouncements. But the Senate is more of a civil body. It is not very much of a religious body. So when they are choosing this with, with Abimelech, they are choosing to appoint him civilly as their king. They are choosing to say, we agree with you. We are not going to follow what God wants. We are going to follow what you, what one man wants. Would that, would that make sense? Well, yeah, I, I just think of the Sanhedrin as also a civil authority as well. Okay. It's Could just be either. they're just kind of clothed together. They they have a a civil and judicial function. But anyway, it's just there's seventy. 
which is a symbol of the Sanhedrin. But um, uh, so the house of Milo or Milo is giving their support after the fact to the murder of Gideon's household. And they are saying that here is money from Baal Bareth, the God of the Covenant, and Abimelech chooses to use that money in the purpose that he deems most necessary. Yeah. So, and so he's going to kill these seventy brothers or the 70 sons of Gideon. Um, and, and, you know, that's why I say there was 70 hired, because, you know, if you're going to kill 70 men, um, you need at least 70 men. Um, and, and the thing is, they're basically going to execute them. So, um, so, so we have these these different 70s, the 70, at least we have the 70 uh, silver coins. Right. So we have that at least to match the 70 sons of Gideon. So <clears throat> as we had read yesterday, Abimelech was successful in his schemes and was accepted at first by the Shechemites and afterward by the people generally as the ruler of Israel. <clears throat> so first he comes and he is accepted by his mother's family. And now because the people wanted someone to lead them, rather than taking and, and examining the message and applying the message as it would relate to their own lives. They wanted this message to be a, a step for them. Now, I don't know if I'm explaining this right. But they're, they're not willing to study. They're not willing to look at this in light of God's word. They're looking at it in the light of man's teachings. Mm -hmm. The Israelites, blinded by their own sinful course of apostasy, were acting directly contrary to God's express commands. And he left them to reap the results of their own folly. Now, is this what, what we want to see within the movement? I would say no. Yeah, definitely not. So, we know that the Shechemites sealed this compact with their new king by presenting him with a sum of money from the treasure, which had been dedicated to the God of the covenant, Baal Bereth. So Abimelech is now wanting and has, has by accepting the money that he's going to use his influence to promote the worship of this false god. Well, I mean, with the money he hires um, these men, Right, a set of unprincipled men who yeah. were ready for any crime. Yeah. Now, when the spirit of prophecy says ready for any crime, that is that paints with a very wide brush. Mm -hmm. Because to me, it means no one was safe. 
they were ready to do whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. But as the spirit of prophecy says, returning in triumph to Shechem, Abimelech was immediately anointed king. Do we see in scripture Abimelech being anointed? Um, well, I don't know if he uses the word anointed, does it? Just says it made Abimelech king. Right. Now, we have some verses. And then we do have um, Jotham just uses the term, the trees went forth in time to anoint a king over them. So, I mean, sometimes anointing the king, uh, I mean, obviously they probably did anoint him. Uh, but it, it is sometimes just an idiomatic expression for making somebody a king. I mean, they use that in Hebrew just like we do in English, even if somebody's not actually physically anointed. But anyway, go on. Okay. Now, there, there's a comment in the chat. And I'm not quite understanding what's being said. Oh, I just... Uh was referring to when Joash had said, he was sarcastic, but he said, let him, Baal, plead for himself because one hath cast down, down his altar and if his son had decided, okay, I'm going to be the messenger like the the hitman of Baal and I'm going to slay the ones who are responsible for trying to return the, the, the nation back to God. Okay. It, it just coming to my mind. Okay. So you're referring back more to Gideon's father. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I, I still don't follow it. But... <clears throat> well, okay. Gideon's father when he stood up for Gideon after Gideon had destroyed the grove and destroyed the altar, gave the comment to the men of Oprah, the men where they lived, to let someone plead for Baal. And the comment was being made that here is Abimelech who is now going to stand up as one to plead for or defend Baal Bareth, the God of the covenant, okay. the God of the false covenant. Yeah, so the idea there is that, uh, but of course, that Baal would plead for himself, because if you're going to plead for him, you're going to be put to death. Right. But isn't, isn't Abimelech showing that, that through his own character, that he was worthy only of death? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, Okay. So I don't know. I, I guess I'm having a hard time with this hitman thing. Okay. But I don't see that in anything in Judges 631. Um, but what you can do is you can definitely connect it back to, to this story in the sense of um, pleading for bail. I mean, he's now uh, trying to, he's restoring the worship of bail. I, but and 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 the reason that he would do this, I mean, in opposition to Gideon's sons, um, because if he was to have the Lord on his side, he couldn't really do that, right? You understand what I'm saying? 
Right. Right. So, you know, because that's definitely the Lord and the way that, that they would look at these things is there, this is a conflict of gods. They wouldn't really look at it as a conflict of men per se. And so if he's going to go against Gideon's sons, he's going to have to take up Baal as, as the God that uh, is on his side. Right. So there's, there's this kind of logic that they have that, that men are really participating in a battle between these different gods. Right. And of course they have a false God that doesn't even really exist, but still that's how they look at it. Right. But it's a sad commentary that after committing murder, Abimelech and those unprincipled men return in triumph to Shechem. Mm -hmm. So here he is. He is now thinking that he has an unobstructed throne, that he alone is going to be the king of Israel. And he is setting himself up as someone extremely special because he is now the first of the sons of Jacob to be appointed and anointed king. Now, when we look at, begin looking at Judges 9, verse 7, starting there. And when they had told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, <clears throat> hearken unto me, you men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. Now, we were discussing this last week how Jotham is standing at the top of Mount Gerizim. And in Deuteronomy 11, verse 29, we would, we would see that the words of Moses from the Lord said, And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee unto the land, whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. And Je Deuteronomy 27, 12, <clears throat> there shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when ye are come over the Jordan, Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. Now, Gideon was of Manasseh, right? Yeah. And he was the poorest in his house, as he saw it, of Manasseh. Yeah. He was not of any of the six tribes that are here mentioned. But he was a son of Joseph. So you have Joseph being shown, but not Manasseh. So is this just because that this is a, a recognition that the two tribes make up one? Yeah. Okay. So then <clears throat> Jotham is standing... I agree from, a ch from the chat. We'll get there in a second. In Joshua 
we read, and all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side, the ark, and on that side before the priests and the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. Now it's recognized in John 4.20, as was pointed out in the chat, the verse that says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So the woman at the well is recognizing that there was worship upon Gerizim, right? Um, I, is it referring to Gerizim in John chapter 4? I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that as referring to Gerizim. I'm just going according to the margin reading because that would link in with the other three verses. My understanding is that it would be Gerizim. That, that is referred to in John 4, verse 2, 20, I mean. Okay. That's not what I would have thought, but. Okay. Then I'm something new. Um, so how do you show that besides just the marginal reference? I think in an archaeological dig, there, there is evidence there of a temple. Okay. Top of uh, Mount Gerizim. Okay. So there's something I've learned. I'm just reading here too, so... This is understood as being Mount Gerizim. So it was not something that I would have thought of. But okay. So Mount Gerizim then. So it's interesting that <clears throat> this woman of Samaria is drawing water from a well that is very near Shechem. And that she is recognizing that there had been worship at Gerizim that was seen as being false worship by the Jews mm -hmm. and is discussing with Christ that Christ is saying that worship should be in Jerusalem. Okay. Okay. So the the well specifically, um, because when she talks about this well, um, that this would have been Jacob that made this well, right? right. So. Because that's four verse twelve. Also four verse six. Oh, and because four five said, "There yeah. cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, or Shechar." So that's so that's Shechem then. Okay. So that would be he, 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 she is in Shechem then. Near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Okay. So if this was given to Joseph, then it was something that would have either gone to that of the tribe of Manasseh or the tribe of Ephraim, or possibly both. Okay, so... So there's differences of opinion of what Sychar is, but um, it's definitely in that area. 
Okay. Um, so some people say it's not Shechem. It's distinguished from it. Some people put it like a mile away, which isn't very far. Um, no, it's so, not. Yeah, so definitely it's in that area. So here we have Jotham. He went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim and hmm. lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said under the olive tree, reign thou over us. Now, why would on a time be added? This is, this is in italics. I don't know, just probably to make it flow better. Well, I mean, if, if it was not there, it would say the trees went forth to anoint a king over them. Mm -hmm. And they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man? And go up and down for other trees, which is the alternate reading. In the yeah. King James, it also, it would say, go to be promoted over other trees. Yeah, which would be better. Okay. Because that's what it would mean. Uh, you know, the idiom doesn't make sense in English. Um, now, of course, the trees here, I mean, we find later they're the cedars of Lebanon. Right. So he doesn't say that at first. He doesn't really say who these trees are. Which would make no sense that these any of these other trees would reign over the cedars of Lebanon. But as we as we look at these. The first three that are addressed, we have the olive. We have the fig. And then we have the grapevine, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Each of these produce a type of fruit. Mm -hmm. The olive, of course, produces olives, which is, it, it's good for food, but it's also largely used to make oil. Mm -hmm. We have the fig. And then we have the wine which is, of course, to make the grape juice, but is the doctrine. Yeah. So with the olive tree, <clears throat> why should I leave my oil? Why should I abandon the leading of the Holy Spirit? With the fig, why should I abandon the teachings of Scripture with the, the vine? Why should I abandon doctrine? Now, with the teachings of Scripture of the fig, would that be better to to have that message be prophecy? Well, yeah, because of the sweetness. Because it is sweet and does not become bitter in the belly? Well, yeah, honey does. But so the sweetness is a message. It's, it's, it would also, you know, you could say it's the gospel as well. But, um, but it's sweet in thy mouth, right? So that's, that has to do with the message. But is this also not 
a another type of symbolic representation of a three-step prophetic testing message? No. Okay. That's not how I've understood this. I mean, you know, you could say it's a three-one combination, right? So, I mean, if you wanted to try to match this up with the three angels' messages in the fourth, but as a um, see, I would look at this more as four generations. I mean, you, you can take the four generations and sort of see them as like a failed reform line as well. But um, I think the emphasis here is more the four, not the three. Okay. So it's more a progressive destruction of four. And, and this is the trees. This is Israel seeking to have um someone reign over them so we would have to if we're going to apply this to israel we we would we could try to say what what is this referring to um you know are these events in the history of the judges or the events in israel in the past you know, further past. Well, <clears throat> if we if we look at this to apply this as four generations, mm -hmm. then the olive, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, being denied leads then to prophecy being denied, leads then to doctrine being denied. Right. And then we come to the bramble, and what's the bramble used for? Well, you might use it for starting fires. But the bramble is prickly. Yeah. The bramble is, is also almost like a scourge yeah it's it's fruitless and it's a weed but the only thing that it's useful for is burning the only thing it's useful for is destruction yeah yeah because you you can use it to start fires you can go and grab some bramble you know start a fire with it as a fire starter to burn something so does this represent what we've seen within the church since 1863? Well, that's the way that I've taken it, if we're going to apply it to the church. I don't know. So the question I'm asking is, could we apply this even to ancient Israel in some way? But, I mean, definitely we can apply it to the four generations of Adventism. Well, <clears throat> if we were to apply this to ancient Israel, if we went, if we took this kind of backwards, by the time of the 70th week, the church at that time did not know much of the doctrines that had been provided by God. They gave them lip service, but they really didn't know, them, right? Were they not in a period of darkness by the 70th week? Yeah, well, yeah, so when we, when we apply... The, the four generations so um yeah i don't i don't yeah i don't know how you connect this to the 70th week i mean they are 
in the 70th week. There is the four generations that happen, but the primary application of the four generations as part, far as the four destruct, the progressive destruction of four is, is the 2520, right? That gives us these progressive destruction of four. Now then, we also have the four generations that were in bond, which typify uh, that connection, right? And we've connected it in lots of different ways. So the four generations are connected to the 2520 that follows later. Uh, we have that whole structure structure of the 252s connecting to the, you know, to 723, etc. cetera. Um, so this must be a prophecy regarding that. But, you know, because we could apply it to, to the future. Um, so that that um, Jotham would be giving this parable regarding their present situation, but it could still be taken as a prophecy about future events okay. that, we, that we can apply to the 2520, because that's going to be against northern Israel, the 2520 that, that I'm talking about, because um, of its connection to... Uh, 723 in the 252s, all the different 252 periods. Um, so, I mean, obviously there's a four, gen four generations. There's a progressive destruction of four uh, from Artaxerxes to, to Christ in the 70 weeks because we have that in Zechariah. So, I'm not sure how how you're doing this. I don't, and, and you talk about going backwards. I don't know if we could go backwards, but I was trying to look at this so that we could we could establish a point because when when they've given up the darkness, or excuse me, when they when they've given up doctrine, yeah, they're no longer walking in light. They no longer understood prophecy. Otherwise, they would have understood that the 490 years of Daniel would have given a relation to the time that they were living in. They were also no longer walking according to the Holy Spirit because at that time, their church was not pure. Now, as Mrs. White has said, when the church is pure, all of the gifts of the spirit will be active, right? Mm. Or am I, am I incorrect in that? Well, okay. Uh, I'm not up there yet. I just... So I, I have to address this... this what, what you're saying okay so so you got 723 BC okay right <clears throat> and we have over here uh, 34 AD And the number of years between here is three times 252, right? Okay. Six years. And if we go another uh, three times 252, this brings us to 14, is it 1471? Let me see. No, it's uh, 
1469. Is that right? You just have to add 756 to there. So that's 1479 there. That's what got. Okay, 1479. And then this 252 here is going to lead us to uh, Jacob blessing his 12 sons. Right? So this is going to be... Um, Seventeen. What is it? Uh, what's the year? I forget. It's, it's uh, seventeen thirty-one. Yes, yeah, seventeen thirty-one. Okay, you see. Okay, so Jacob's twelve sons. Okay. Right. So, so we had we had looked at this period of two hundred and fifty-two years. This is going to be um, after these two periods of seven years. So this is going to be uh, the land has rest. Or, so this is dealing with the land having rest from its enemies, right? Now we know, of course, this is going to be uh, Samaria being taken captive. Okay. Or northern Israel being taken captive in connection with the destruction of Samaria that happens two years later. Okay, so we have so remember for 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 Judah, we have a progressive destruction of four. That is, we have, have the 2520, but theirs is different than northern Israel, right? All right. Right, because northern Israel is not going to have a 2520 in the same way. Now, Ellen White, dealing with Deuteronomy and Leviticus 26, and you put all of her statements together, where she talks about uh, the captivity of, of, of Israel in Assyria, right, by the Assyrians. And then you're going to have the captivity of Judah by the Babylonians, right? So in Babylon. And but that prophecy receives a partial fulfillment in the book of the of Judges, right? That's what Ellen White says. There's a partial fulfillment in the book of Judges, but a more complete fulfillment with the captivity of Israel in Assyria and Judah in Babylon. So that's a statement in this fair prophecy. Um, so... Here we have in the period of the judges. So the period of the judges is going to be in here in this period of time. Right. And then, of course, you're going to have the end of the judges where you're going to have the kings of of, of Israel. So somewhere here, we're going to have this prophecy. So the prophecy of Joth Jotham, because that's what we need to look at it as. Um. Because even though he's making a parable, isn't a parable a prophecy? In many ways, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, he's illustrating something that's happening. You're going to have uh, the olive tree, the fig tree, um, the vine, and then the bramble. And to me, this is a progressive destruction of four. This is, you know. So you're you're equating this. this always, what's that? You're equating this more with Joel's insects. Yeah, that's another example of it. It's also the 2520 to four, seven times is a progressive destruction of four. Okay. But here in, in the period of the judges, what this is going to lead to is, is ultimately they're going to have a king over them, right? But this here is referring to the king that they're going to have over them for northern Israel, right? Because this is really about northern Israel, isn't it? This story, even though we don't have the divided kingdom yet, uh, this is more about how northern Israel's history is going to go. So Abimelech 
is typifying something that's going to happen. You know, we could even say with Jeroboam becoming king. Does that make sense to people what I'm talking about? I think it's giving additional references and examples to what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so I, don't, I don't know exactly how to place this. All I'm saying is that this is, to me, a symbol of the progressive destruction of four in a rejection of, um, like, and here, of course, the olive tree is the one doing the rejection, right? But that means there's an attempt to have a king over them. Now, if we, if we equate this to Adventism, this would be the four generations of Adventism. So in other words, <clears throat> let's if we were to take this starting in 1863. Well, I would start it in 1844, but because that's where the fourth generation begins. But, but yeah, so we have a rejection that, that's going to occur in the four generations of Adventism. What I was what I was trying to refer to. Uh -huh. I'm not disagreeing with starting some of this in 1844 and and how it how it goes down, but in 1863 the position is taken that the 2520 is not a prophecy, and it's highly promoted by Uriah Smith. Yeah. In a period of time within 46 years, you have not only the 2520 being rejected, but you have the spirit of prophecy being rejected. And by the time we get to 1909, they're even questioning the validity of the daily being paganism. Mm -hmm. Now, we have of, from 1909 to 1955, a time period where even the prophetic understandings, the 1260, the 1335, the 2300, the 1290, all of these are being set aside with it by the church itself. Mm -hmm. From 1955 to 2001, the church <clears throat> no longer knows its doctrines. And by 2001, a king is now selected because the church has now decided that it's important that spiritual formation be accepted. Yeah, so you're just marking the events. The, you're not marking the generations. You're just marking events that happened there. But even in 2001, I mean, 2001 is just an event that happens in the fourth generation. It's not. I mean, the bramble is there long before. Right? No disagreement. Yeah, so... <clears throat> 
I mean, we normally mark questions of doctrine as, as marking the fourth generation. 1919 is marking the third, 1888 uh, the second, and 1844 the first generation. So there is events that happen in each of those generations that is um, a failure of, of the messages. I mean, in some ways, you could sort of say, you know, because the first angel's message is rejected, um, you know, in 1863, right? And then you have the rejection of the second angel's uh, message um, in, uh, well, which specifically, where would we mark the rejection of the second angel's message? Or would that be a rejection of the second angel's message in 1863, not the first angel's message? Well, <clears throat> in this situation, depending <clears throat> depending on if you're if you're dealing with generations or the waymarks. By yeah, well, I think that the generations here. I, I don't know if I would take these as the waymarks. I mean, these are the generations. I mean, there's way marks in each of these generations. The point that I that I'm trying to get at is that in these in these time periods, 1863 to 1909, 1909 to 1955, 1955 to 2001, you have the steps in setting up a false tabernacle, a false method of worship. The situation. Yeah, I, I just wouldn't do it that way with these four trees. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I agree with you that that, that happens. But I don't think that that's what this is referring to. If we're going to apply to Adventism, this would have to be the four generations themselves. So... <clears throat> I'm trying to look at as to how we could place the first, second, and third angel's message because we're aware that by 1888, the third angel's message is summarily dismissed because the church is not going to accept it. Right. So that's at the end of the first generation, all three messages are rejected. Right. But this isn't about the three angels' message. This is the progressive destruction of four. Each of them has a reform line within themselves that I mean that you could look at. When you deal with the fourth generation, which begins in 1957, it begins a period of darkness. 1989 is of the arrival of the first angel's message. Right? For the movement. Well, that's, yeah, because we're not dealing with, because uh, we're dealing with um, the repeat of history. I mean, you, and, and you can't just get rid of the repeat of history as part of the structure, um, because then we can't even look at the four generations, at least in my thinking. I mean, if you were going to say, okay, here's another way of looking at it. If, if I'm going to try to look at it how you're looking at it, we have the big line, so I'll get rid of this. We have the line that Ellen White has. So she has the third angel arrives. That's October 22, 1844, right? Correct. And we're going to have the Sunday law. You know, with that, the loud cry, you know, the close of probation, the plagues, and the second coming, right? So you're going to have all of that over here. Now, she doesn't, she doesn't mark the four generations here, right? 
because because this is this is something that can come way over here, you know, even even in 1863, or even in connection with 1893, right? So you have these these reforms that are going on, even in the second generation, what we would call the second generation of Adventism. But Ellen White doesn't have that in her line. But let's say we were going to to say that there is this wandering in the wilderness, if you're going to put the 40 years here, we could at least say that there's a four generations that happens here. And, and you could then try to say that there is, there is these events. So you were putting 1863, um, 1888, or were you putting 1909 here? I was putting more 1909. Okay, 1909. And then you were putting 1955, right. 2001, right? Which would be this history of the Sunday law, right? Correct. Okay. So this is taking, this isn't, these are just events. And you're saying that that's what this would represent rather than the generations themselves. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I would do that though. All right. But I mean, you could be right. Um, uh, I mean, because this thing is a so even when we look at this story, so we have the trees that is God's people, the church. They are seeking to have a king over them. Now, I mean, you could try to argue in 1863, you know, they want to have a king, but they don't really get a king. I don't, I don't know about 1909, per se, um, you know, because this to me is, uh, I mean, this does lead to, I guess, but, you know, that happens before this. I mean, as far as when I look at the Bramble, I mean, this is where the church organization um, is ruling us. I mean, I don't know if you could put this down to 2001. I mean, I know you're using the spiritual formation, but the church has already rejected the message long before that. I mean, does there, is there a real change that happens here in the church that hasn't happened in 1989 or even really in 1957? I mean, to me, 1957 represents the brown wall much better questions on doctrine. But maybe I'm just persistent in looking at something a certain way. Anyway, that's the illustration. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say about this is that, I mean, we have to see this pattern in other stories, right? So we see a progressive destruction of four. Four generations has been given to us right. um, as a model in mm -hmm. which to analyze history, apostasy. Now, you know, when I first looked at this, I said, how is, how is he applying how is Jotham applying this parable, right? I mean, he would, I mean, is he referring to some specific events in the past that the vine does not seek to be promoted over the trees, that the fig tree does not, you know, I'm going back backwards, seek to be promoted over the trees, or um, the olive tree not want to be promoted over the trees? But yet the trees, in a sense, are looking for that. So are these some events in the history, either the history of the judges or even in the history that precedes the story of the judges? You know, that's because I don't know what his application is 
other than that we have the bramble is going to represent Abimelech. We know that. But is he actually thinking about these as different events in history or different periods of time in which this has not happened? We didn't have a king over us. But now, as we've progressed through this history, now we do have a tree over us. And this tree is just a bramble. I mean... So that's that's the way I was looking at. It. So so I was looking at it that way. But then I was saying, well, if this is true of the past, then that's fine. But maybe it's just a prophecy of the future. And then and of course, if it's of the future of of ancient Israel, we could place this in the future. But also, it would apply to our time. So, so we're ready to take this and apply it to Adventist history. But normally when we look at a prophecy, we, we see how it first applies. And that's where, you know, where I'm struggling with trying to understand this. I think that we all have some application that we're going to have to make to be able to better understand this. Yeah. And, and of course, we have the symbols here, the olive, the fig, the vine. Um, and, and could this represent different uh, periods of time? Um, so one of the things, you know, here we have the bramble. Well, we, we could go backwards and, and we could say, well, Gideon, uh, didn't they want Gideon to reign over them? Yes. Okay, so is in any way can Gideon be represented by the vine? Would he have been represented by the vine or would he have been represented by a combination of the vine, the fig and the olive? So you're going to take uh, six, seven, and eight as referring to the olive fig and the vine, and then chapter nine as the bramble. You understand what I'm asking? I do understand what you're asking. Yes. Okay. Because because we had taken these because this would go back to your idea um, dealing with the three angels' messages, right? Right. So we have we have three story stories. Uh, Midian oppresses Israel. That's going to be the call of Gideon, right? And right. his destruction of the altar of Baal. Um, chapter 7 is going to be the 300. And chapter 8, defeating Ziba and Zalmunna. Now, it's going to be specifically at the end of this story that they're going to seek to make him uh, king or ruler. That doesn't say specifically king. Uh, but he says he's not going to rule over them, right? So, so if you're saying you you're saying that we could take these three aspects, we could take the oil, um, the fig tree, and the vine, and somehow apply it to these three different symbols, to these three different chapters, and then chapter nine would represent Abimelech's conspiracy and and the bramble. Any any thoughts on this idea? I mean, I know we're, we're, we're struggling here trying to, to see how we should understand it. You know, it would be kind of hard for people watching this out of context. Um, well, with, with Gideon, you had him threshing wheat at the right in the wine press. Yeah. So you I know. have wine connected with Gideon. Yeah. Yeah, so, but that would be, of course, the, you know, we couldn't just, just take then the olive and connect it with that story in chapter six, right? I mean, that would be the third one. But maybe maybe we could just say that all of these characteristics are symbolic of Gideon. Um, and so he ties them up in, in that way to, the, to Gideon, who refuses to be king. 
but Abimelech is going to choose to be king. But he's just, he doesn't have any of these characteristics. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He he doesn't have prophecy or doctrine on his side. And, and yet he's going to seek to take a place that Gideon never took. And, and that would make sense for Jotham to apply it in that way, in that he knows about his father's rejection of the kingship and, and uh, Amalek's, you know, desire to be a king. And Stephen, any other things you see in the, in what we're talking about? I mean, I know we got the wine press. You not know, maybe apply the fig tree and the olive tree to previous judges. You no, know, maybe yeah. like so. So that were... was yeah. So that was the other idea I had. So I mean, because that's kind of the first idea, I guess, was to say, well, there's this period of the judges. Um, now we don't have these other judges per se, any story about them rejecting the kingship in the sense that Gideon did. Um, but maybe, maybe we could tie it to some of the other judges, at least just as a symbol that there is this progression where people had an opportunity or wanted to have a king over them. Right, but God has still been their king. So I don't know where where we would specifically apply this. But that that's the initial idea I had. Anybody else with thoughts on this or because when we go back, um, um you know we have Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. So we have these, uh, you know, I, I mean, maybe what we should do, um, because it's going to be, see, because it's not really till till here that we have this enemy sort of as, as a relative or the enemy within. I mean, we do sort of have it. But this Midian oppression is different than the preceding uh once because with here you're going to have um in the story of deborah and barak uh you're going to have this story of um jabin and his general sisera right um so so this story here you're still having these enemies that are um outside even though there's you know, because it's going to make a way for the children of the East, et cetera. So then in chapter six, you now have this Midianite oppression, but this Midianite oppression is going to lead to the Amalekites and the children of the East coming up against them. And, and in this story, this had to do with uh, the Midianites representing uh, strife or conflict or basically um, disunity that comes into the movement. That's how we were applying it. So um, so if we go back, we have the story of Deborah and Barak, and we have the story of this Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. So, so could we take this story of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar as representing, um, you know, but see, then you would have a Deborah and Barak. This would be uh, the vine, and this would be um, the fig tree, and then maybe the olive go back to the time of Joshua. I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing things out here. I don't have any solid ways of understanding this. I just think that somehow we have to understand that this is the Jotham isn't just saying a parable. You know, to illustrate the fact that Othni or not Othni, uh, Abimelech is is a bramble, but he he's specifically ch choosing these three symbols, marking them out, and and they 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 obviously represent something in the future, but they must be based upon something in the past.
Okay, so the olive goes back maybe to the priesthood. Uh, Angela is suggesting. So not just the anointing of a king, but the because the priests are anointed as well. Correct. So what if we what if we put uh, the anoint the olive to represent the priesthood that could have ruled over God's people, but chose they definitely chose to follow God, right? To have God as their king. Then the fig would represent what? Like, I mean, we haven't done a deep study into the fig, but we don't do know the fig represents the church itself, right? It represents Israel. Would we place the figs as being Levites? No. No, it'd have to be with the, uh, because that's part of the priesthood. But you have the priests that have to teach the Levites, and it's the Levites and the message that the Levites receive that becomes the message to the rest of the world. Yeah, and but you're putting it into the future. I'm putting it into the past. I'm dealing okay. with I'm dealing with the fact that you had the priesthood in the past, right? In the time of like Moses, right? Aaron. If, if you that please, time. Is if, that referring to the pe to the period of the olive tree? That's what I'm saying. Okay, if you place it if you place it into the past, then would it be the priests and then the people? And the message then to go out to the rest of the world as being the as being the vine. Okay. Um, because Israel was not supposed to keep this as a you know a, a message only unto themselves. They were supposed to be the example to all of the world. Right. So this would refer to, um, so if we had the time of Moses, I mean, could we take the fig tree as referring to the time of Joshua? So if the olive refers to the time of Moses and the priesthood being set up, then we have Joshua. So he's now a leader. Um, but he's still going to have God as king. Right. And so he could represent the period of the fig, the fig tree. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. We could say that Joshua is still a part of that. We could say, because you have Othniel, Ehud, and uh, Shamgar. And, and they're not going to become kings, Right. So we see these people who are not going to become kings. They're judges, but they're not going to become kings. Gideon is a judge, and he could be represented by the vine. He chooses not to be a king. But now we have Abimelech, and he chooses to be a king. But these others are worthy of being kings in a certain sense, right? I mean, much more than a bramble, at least. But they recognize that they have a role and a responsibility that is not being king. Right? Because God is our king. Okay. So, so you see kind of the logic of how I'm trying to look at this. I'm trying to find our initial application. Can we place this as, as events? or as referring to something concrete rather than just being a, um, a parable that, you know, is just trying to illustrate the, um, the inferiority of Abimelech, but he's comparing it to something and that something must be real. If you understand what I mean. So, so this must have happened from Jotham's point of view. And now, and, and I could see how he could take his father, Gideon, as being the vine. And then, and then we're going to have this bramble, Abimelech. So 
so people see what we're doing. I mean, um, I know it's hard. I can't see your faces or anything. Can't see how people are following this. Then we can make an application in the future. If we can see that it is referring to four different periods of time, and, and we could even take it as, you know, the first period being the time of Moses, the second period being the time of, of Joshua, and the third period just being the time of the judges up until Abimelech. All right. Now, I know you, you brought us here because you were going to bring us back to the spirit of pro prophecy to read. You brought us here for a reason to make an illustration. And, and that was for, particularly regarding um, Gerizim and the Mount of Blessing and so forth to get into the story here. Correct. Right. So, I mean, we're going to have to come back to that tomorrow. So I know we get, we're getting a bit sidetracked. Well, sidetracked isn't the right word. We're just... We're trying to understand the details of this story so that we can put it on a line. Right. We, we have to have an understanding of this parable and the actions that are represented within the parable in order to be able to go forward. Yeah. And see, the thing about Jotham, I mean... He represents something in this movement at the present time because he's the, the 70th week. And we have a message regarding the 70th week that has come to this movement, right? So back in 2018, we studied the week of Christ. It pointed to the first day of the first month being April 5th, 2030, but we ignored that because that was too far in the future. But then as we've progressed now to the present time because the story of judges chapter nine is is referring more to the present time than to something in the past in this movement but jotham is going to reach back into the past and he's going to take this illustration to show us that the direction that we have gone as a movement has been wrong right that is we are now just the bramble seeking to rule over the trees and and so we need to understand our role the, the role of jotham of what that message is what it's telling us not what it's just telling you know the church or somebody out there because this is a message to us and and we have now been ruled over by the bramble in the present time in this movement. So we should be able to take these stories of the all of the fig and the vine to refer to periods within the history of our movement itself. That is, he's re if he's reflecting back upon the past, I mean, he must be reflecting back upon the past since 9-11, right? If we're gonna apply it to our movement, how we understand judges. Is that is that making sense to people what I'm saying? I think that you're you're giving a good foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to work out the details here, but yeah, we do. Yeah, but I, but to me, that's just the only reasonable way I can look at it because of how we're interpreting this. Now, sure, we can look at ancient Israel and we can look at the church, but the primary way that we've understood this is Judges is referring to 2001 to 2023. Now, of course, we could say that Jotham is simply referring to past history, right? But if we're going to apply it to this movement specifically, um, it's not enough just to look at, at past history prior to 9-11. We must be looking at the history after 9-11 within this movement itself. And so these would be messages because the, the, the bramble is a message. 
And if the bramble is a message, then the vine is a message, the fig tree is a message, and the olive tree are messages. The, the messages that should be guiding us because of their example in that Christ. So we had these good messages in this movement, didn't we? I think that we have. But we now have a message in this movement that's basically like the bramble. It's not going to give us good fruit. It's going to give us thorns. It's prickly, like a thistle. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's where we're stopping, and uh, we'll pick this up tomorrow. Let's close right. with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for these studies, uh, for each person who participates in them, who watches them on YouTube, who contemplates uh, these things. We ask, Lord, that you can continue to enlighten our minds. We know that we are, are trying to discern what is truth so that we can have a clear understanding of where we are presently. And so we need your help. Please be with those who are suffering in various ways, with health and, and in other ways. And be with us throughout this day. May your angels watch over us. May your Holy Spirit speak to us. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.